Hello, and welcome to Penzik University. Today, I'm going to be talking about Anglo-Saxon embroidery. This class is about the embroidery and psalm weaving done by the early English between 450 and 1100 CE on the island of Great Britain. This time period covers the centuries from the end of the Roman occupation up to the conversion of the pagans to Christianity. After you take this class, you should have a good understanding about the existing scraps of embroidery that we have available to us via archeological digs. You will also see how designs were not limited to embroidery, but echoed in other objects as well, such as sword hilts, architecture, and illuminated pages, such as the detail from the Book of Doro carpet page shown at the right. Before we dive in, I want to talk about terminology. Scholars are moving away from the term Anglo-Saxon and replacing it with early English for several reasons. First, Anglo-Saxons never called themselves Anglo-Saxons. They called themselves the English. E-N-G-L-I-S-C. Second, the term is culturally inaccurate as tribes from other than the Angles and the Saxons were migrating to Great Britain at the time, such as the Jutes from Jutland, which is now part of Denmark. And last, the term Anglo-Saxon has been co-opted by the far right to promote the superiority of whiteness and Many people really aren't interested in being part of that uh, opinion. So we're gonna turn our backs on the term Anglo-Saxon and I'm gonna try to remember to use the words early English throughout this class. So how do we know about early English embroidery? We have grave finds, we have finds in sealed coffins, we've got things from peat bogs, we have the remains of fires, we have workshop leftovers, and we use continental equivalents, meaning what was going on on the continent that people were migrating from could have migrated to Great Britain. The grave at the left is a great example of why items don't survive. The acidic soil has destroyed everything the only remains are the outline of the skeleton in the sand. So why do we have so few embroidery fragments? Well, that's a many fold answer. The formal study of embroidery did not begin until the Victorian age. Before that, no one had tried to recognize and catalog embroideries or recognize them as a valid way to understand culture. Many archeologists at the time, and even today, are not trained to value textiles. So to the uninterested eye, a scrap of embroidery in a grave may look like a piece of straw mat or an uninteresting wrapping, something to be ignored and discarded. Also, the finds are very small. I did some reproductions of finds that are lost, and I did the reproductions by drawings and the text description. And you can see they're not much bigger than the size of a quarter. This is what the fragments really look like. So instead of blaming the archeologists for not getting it right, this is what they would have to recognize in dirt as a valid piece of culture. And these things have been unrolled, probably cleaned and laid out in a way that you could understand that they are textile. But when you see things like this, now you understand why archeologists probably wouldn't recognize them. And even if they did, and you're short staffed, what do you do? Do you deal with a wadded up textile fragment or toss it aside in your quest for the next sword or brooch? 
The first find that we're going to talk about is the earliest find. It is the Orkney hood, and it is from somewhere between 250 and 615 CE. It is a child's hood made from recycled wool twill. There's nine different kinds of yarn in the find. And there's a double row of chain stitch over the seams to hide them. But it also gives the seams strength. So this is our first bit of embroidery. It has tablet weaving on the back. And the unusual feature for this find is it has a long fringe. Now, we don't know if long fringes were unusual at the time, but it is unusual for us to find something like this because it's one of one, I believe, in that area. This was found in a peat bog in the 19th century, and it's currently housed in the National Museum of Scotland. And I did an example of a double row of chain stitch so you could see what that looks like. Of course, it would be much smaller when it's done in scale. I made this example large so that you could see the form of the stitch. So we're going to take a detour into tablet weaving versus ankle weaving. On the Orkney hood, as I mentioned, there is tablet weaving on the back of the hood. It, tablet weaving is a period weaving style that dates back to about 850 BCE. Inkle weaving was developed much later. And though it is perfectly acceptable for SCA costuming purposes, please don't put something inkle woven into an ANS display for the early English period because that kind of stitching, that kind of weaving didn't exist at that time. And on the left, you can see examples made by Mistress Khalid. So the Kempston fragment is one of the fragments that I reproduced because the actual fabric and embroidery itself is really hard to discern in a, in a classroom like this where you need to see colors on the big screen. So the Kempston fabric was found in the 600s. It was found in a copper alloy box in a cemetery at a gravel quarry. It was probably a female grave. And the fragment was possibly kept by her as a contact relic, meaning it's a relic that has touched the skin of a saint. I don't know why the archeologists would have decided that this is a fragment that she kept on her person, as a relic as opposed to a piece of her own garment. I don't know what the thought process was for that and it's not described anywhere in text that I can find. This fragment is chain stitch, split stitch and stem stitch done in silk on a wool ground. It's tiny as you can see when I compare it to the size of a quarter. The style appears similar to the art found on the great gold buckle found at Sutton Hoo. And it's also similar to the borders of the carpet page from the Book of Doro. This was found in 1863-64 by a private family. Now let's talk about scale. You must be wary of photos and books. Sometimes the authors enlarge the scale of the embroidery and provide you with no information about the size next to the image. This is a photo of the embroidery in the book next to the reproduction that I made that is actual size. And unless you're smart enough to go look at the actual dimensions of the real fragment and compare it to the dimensions of the drawing, you're not going to realize the size difference. And it's quite a big difference. The Worthy Park fragment is from Worthy Park, and it's lost. It's from the mid 500s to mid 600s. It may have been an accessory worn on the belt that was laid under a knife. It was found in an inhumation burial 
and the gender of the burial is unknown. It was a possible leaf and scroll pattern with silk thread done in satin and stem stitch. And the stem, the stitch length is about one millimeter. The size of the fabric is given, and it was about one inch by five eighths inch, but the size of the embroidery was not given. So I'm just guessing that if they described the embroidery as possible leaf and scroll, then there had to have been some kind of scrolling vine and a leaf attached to that. This was found during the 1962 to 79 excavation. And unfortunately, the conservation methods at the time rendered all textile fragments that still adhered to metal unusable for any examination. And I've included a photo from the Priory of St. Mary in St. Hartle from England that shows a vine and leaf scroll pattern. So again, we're having something that may have been on a garment and embroidery echoing also a design of architecture. Sutton Hoo. A lot of people know about Sutton Hoo. There are burial mounds in Suffolk, England that date to the 500, 600s. Sutton Hoo A was excavated in 1939 and the coins in the grave suggest that it might be the grave of a king. Sutton Hoo B was excavated much later in 1983 to 91, and it is believed to have been a female burial. At this time, embroidery was done at the village level by women who were taught by mothers and female relatives. The expertise was very high and the stitch length was tiny. I want to make a comment about sewing and garments here. The sewing thread of the Sutton Hoo garment is the same dyed thread as the garment textile was woven from. So keep that in mind when you're doing your reproductions. There is a embroidered sleeve that was found at Sutton Hoo. And my friend Anne did a reproduction of this last year for this class. She used a wool blend floss for her reproduction. She used stem stitch on the crosses of the sleeve and chain stitch for the bars. And in the drawing, we're going to show this pretty soon. There is a uh, buttons on the cuff. You would think that they are buttons. These could be metal or they could be embroidered. And we're going to talk about that later. And this is later. We're going to do a comparison of this migration era tunic from Sweden to the Sutton Who cuff. This Swedish burial is estimated to be about 500 CE, so it's contemporary with people migrating to Great Britain. And the shadow of the buttons on the left are mimicked by the embroidery of the sleeve cuff on the right. So this shows the through line from one culture in Sweden to the early English culture in Great Britain. I'm showing this to you because it's a mistake and it's my mistake and it is a teaching moment so you don't make the same kinds of mistakes. When I was doing some very basic research to go out there and try to wrap my mind around what kind of outfits were worn by Anglo-Saxon, sorry, early English women, this came up and it was a photo of and a display in the Dover Museum in Kent. The problem is this image is very old and it's also very problematic. The weaving on the cuff is more Celtic in origin than early English. I didn't know that at the time. And my friend uh, Deneff reproduced this weaving for me, which is lovely, but it is not Anglo-Saxon. So. The lesson here is when you're doing your research, just because you find an image on the internet that says it's from a museum 
you, you have to do more research. You have to find out if this is a current display or if this outfit was from 25, 30 years ago and we've learned so much in the interim. So do your research. Here we have another continental equivalent. This is Queen Arnigan's cuffs from about 570. And it was found at the Basilica of Saint Denis in France. And Ascadian did a reproduction of it as I'm showing below. This was gold work on silk. And even though this is not found in England, this is during the migration period when people were migrating from other places and bringing their knowledge with them. The Basilica of St. Denis is only 223 miles from the coast of England. So if somebody made that trip from the continent to England, they could have brought their skills with them. And if this had been embroidered in England, it would have been for somebody of very high status. Now we're going to cover Queen Batilde's shirt. This is from about 680. This is the tunic of a Merovingian queen, and it's held in the Musée Alfred Bono shell, which is about 230 miles from the coast of England. It shows the influence of the Byzantine Empire. It is not early English, but again, early English adjacent. If people were migrating from the mainland to Great Britain, they could have brought this skill set with them. And this is silk embroidery on linen. And it's done in a chain stitch and possibly a split stitch as well. There are more photos of this available online and I have the link in the bibliography at the end. Embroiderers in period who are not queens or saints. I wanted to put some names to these women who did this work back in the day. So I have some documented names that I'll share with you here. First, we have Enswitha, and she is the first female embroiderer documented in an 800s charter. She was granted a lifelong lease for a 200 acre farm by a bishop. So the 800s is getting towards the end of this early English period. But this is the first time we're seeing women's names associated with embroidery and text. The next woman is Ethel Swift, and she was documented in a will in the 1000s. Her mother willed her land to the church if Ethel Swift did not marry, and she did not. Instead, she worked as an embroiderer on a church estate. Then we have Leofka, who embroidered gold work for the king and queen, and she's listed in the Doomsday Book. We have Elfgif, which is also, she's also listed in the Doomsday Book. And then we have Leviva and Ingrid, who are documented in a church inventory as having provided embroidery for the church. So now we're going to play What If. I don't know if you folks are aware of the Marvel comic series, What If, but they went on to imagine what if the superhero was really some other kind of superhero. So my game of embroidery, what if, is if what if this pattern that we see on this sword hill was actually used in embroidery? Because we've already seen evidence that things on objects that that lived to come into our possession also could have been found on other objects. So this is the Fiskerton sword and it's found in the 800s. It's from the 800s and it was found by a little boy in 1954. The metalwork on this sword shows similarities to the Osberg H embroidery that's found in Norway. So caveat here, there's a theory that the Osberg age is woven. So I recommend to you to see the bibliography, bibliography for online Osberg textile photos. This is design inspiration only. 
So if you're going to cite this, I would cite this with care and be upfront about the fact that you're copying this pattern from a sword hilt. So I did this pattern on the cuff of a dress that I made and the colors are speculative. But we have so little hard evidence to go on for embroidery that I'm grasping at straws trying to tell you what kind of patterns that you can use. Here's another sword. It's the Abingdon sword. It's from the late 800s, early 900s. Again, we're getting at the end of the period of the early English. This sword was found at Bog Mill on the River Thames. And I'm just gonna read this quote to you. The style of leaf used next to the figure of the eagle on the upper guard has also been identified on early 10th century embroideries from Durham. We're going to talk about those later. On the back of the Alfred Jewel and on a number of other objects dating to this period. The pommel incorporates two outward looking animal heads now with protruding ears and round eyes and nostrils now fragmentary. And that quotes from the Ashmolean Museum. So my friend Dessa turned this B and B uh, sword design into a embroidery. Oh, this book that I list here in the corner, Lost Art, the Anglo-Saxon World. If you want to know about embroideries, that's the book to read. They, that author lists just about everything and I highly recommend it. So here's the patterns that I made from some sword hilts. These are options for you. Use them with care. Be upfront about the fact that they're not documentable as textiles, but that they're documentable as art of the period that you're using for inspiration. The Gilling Sword. Here's another sword that was found by another little boy and it's from the 800s. So getting towards the end of that early English period. This is a design inspiration only. It's not a documentable piece of textile. But we know the geometric forms were very popular at the time. So use it, but use it with care. Langor. This was found in 1990 by archaeologists in Wales and they found it in waterlogged silt. The textile was charred and fragile. We don't know if it was charred because it was part of an inhumation or it caught fire accidentally, don't know. This is currently found in the Museum of Wales and the text about this Fragment says the base material was a very fine, plain weed linen. Silk and linen threads have been used to decorate the textile with birds and other creatures within a framework of vines and with borders containing repeating patterns or lions. This is a very small fragment. One thing I will note is I looked at this and a couple other people looked at this too when I was uh, doing Q&A for the class. And we think that the museum might have put the wrong embroidery up next to this description. I, I think the drawing is correct. I don't know if the actual embroidery image on the top is correct. The Osberg burial. This is from Norway. We talked about this a little bit before. This is an example of how embroideries have similar patterns to other artwork in period. So we have the drawing of Osberg J on the left. And then we have a sword hilt, the Fetter Lane sword hilt on the right. And you can see that pattern is very, very similar. So if you're going to argue with people about using sword hilts as inspiration for your embroidery, this is a pretty valid argument here. 
Um, new research suggests that the Osberg textiles were actually made in Germany. Um, the jury's still out on that. For me, I, I haven't read that yet. Osberg weaving. So uh, again, I'm gonna talk about weaving here. These are samples of Osberg weaving by Mr. Scalib. She found the style on an internet search, but I've been to, um, I have been to a site that has to do with Osberg online and this looks exactly like some of their uh, weaving. She got the pattern from Hollingsworth. The May Psych embroideries from 800. Again, these are later. So these are eight embroideries, which are believed to have been originated as decorative bands, probably from secular garments, giving to the shrine of sister saints uh, in Belgium. They are believed to have been made in early England. The stitch length is larger than you would expect for that period. Um, the gold thread on the embroideries has a cattle tail hair as the core, which is a little abnormal. The core of gold um, thread is usually silk, but silk was not produced in Great Britain at the time. It's possible that local goldsmiths saw the imported gold thread with the silk core and figured out how to make it with a locally available core. The base fabric is undyed tabby weave linen, and it is believed to have been made in a workshop by several different embroiderers. For a detailed technical analysis and history of these embroideries, please go view Dr. Alexander Macon's YouTube video. It's very good. The Masic embroideries continued. So on the left, you see the original, and on the right, my friend Vadama did a reproduction for me for this class. Vadama is a, a master embroiderer, so she's, this is well within her well, wheelhouse. On the far left of her sample, you see a paper pattern with the drawing on the pattern. Then you see in the next column, Vidama outlined the pattern and tore away the paper. In the next column, you see her doing the silk work. In the final column, you see the gold work. Now, Vidama, this is not indicative of her skill set. She used materials that she had on hand. She didn't go out and buy the appropriate materials. So that's why it looks a little rough. But when you look at the original embroidery, the original embroidery doesn't look a heck of a lot better. So um, this is an, an in progress of, of how this embroidery could have been done. I don't think they would have torn away paper on top of the embroidery when they were first laying their pattern down. It might've been a pick and pounce method but uh, we don't know. And there is a penny on the screen for size. The mammon embroideries. I'm gonna move my little head here on the screen. The mammon embroideries from work from the 900s. And again, we're getting towards the end of that period. These are early English adjacent. These were discovered in Denmark. They were in the chamber grave of a man who was buried in the center in the winter of 970, 971. The thread colors are red, blue, and yellow. The stitch type was close rows of stem stitch. The motifs are more than what's just shown on this page. Uh, human masks, which you see on this sleeve cuff, vines, herringbone stitches, leopards, birds, and unidentified beasts. There is a well-read, well-loved piece of documentation by Heather Rose Jones at the link on this slide that gives you a lot of information about the mammon embroideries. So again, 
if people were migrating from Denmark to Great Britain, they would bring this knowledge and skill set with them. This slide is a relic pouch. This is from 975. This was found in a commercial setting in Coppergate, York. It was last held at the Yorkshire Museum and it's currently lost. Um, I'm somewhat horrified that a museum would lose such an old piece of embroidery, but I don't work at a museum. I don't know what their limitations are. I don't know what their staffing is. So something the size of a quarter, I can see it getting lost. The pouch was made from purple twill silk and the size is 33 by 30 millimeters. It was embroidered with chain stitch and the color of the embroidery thread was not given. When the pouch was opened, plant material fell out, which was either the relic itself or wrapped around the relic. It could have been linen. It could have been a clipping from the garment of a saint or something that had touched the saint's body. My reproduction here is made of silk with silk thread. The York B cuff is from the 900s. It was found in York and it's currently lost. There is a drawing of it in Lost Art of the Anglo-Saxon World. So I made my own archeological find, if you will, just to see how big it was. The fabric is twill, the thread is wool, and a loop stitch was used to bind the raw edge of the, of the cuff. The textile uh, is that's its height and width, and it's very, very small. If I was gonna guess, I would say it went around the wrist of a child. The colors are speculation in this sample. I made it so that there was high contrast so that you could see it on the slide. The Cuthbert embroideries are found at the Durham Cathedral. So now we're talking about cathedral. Now we're talking about pagans who are now going to church. This was given as gifts from Queen Alfred to Bishop Prithestan. This is a great example of how the nobility interacted with the church and an expensive gift of gold embroidered vestments would confer great political power to the queen. It would be the medieval version of the charm offensive. So if you like doing fancy embroidery for your SCA persona, you can have the backstory that your persona is making the fancy embroidery for the church. Sadly, it is believed that because of the various machinations of the king, the bishop never received his gifts. More about the Cuthbert embroideries. It's laid work in silk and metal. It's a transition from the Bayou Tapestry to op Opus Anglicanum. The rondel below uses the underside couching technique. There's far more pictures about the Cuthbert embroideries available. These are just a couple. And for more information about the Cuthbert mantle, go see Dr. Macon's videos about her reproduction of a small image on the manticle using funds from a Janet Arnold grant. The Bayou Tapestry, which as you may or may not know, isn't really a tapestry. It's an embroidered cloth, nearly 230 feet long and 20 inches tall. It depicts the events leading up to the Norman conquest of England. It is thought to date within a few years after the Battle of 1066. It tells the story from the point of view of the conquering Normans, but people agree that it was made in England. The original embroidery is a wool on linen. Note that because of the length of the loose threads in this embroidery, it's not a great stitch for clothing. People do it, but 
I probably wouldn't because you can catch that thread on something if you're just brushing your hand up against a railing or something. So now we're heading way, way late for early England, but I wanted to include this. In Greenland, there have been a bunch of finds of hoods, mostly hoods in the ground. Uh, why? Because of the cold weather kept them. They finished off their hems with overcast stitches. And I believe it's not a far cry to think that the early English would have been doing something similar. We saw the early English finishing off the edge of that cuff. They're going to do something to their necklines as well. Interesting to note, I did a big research paper last year about hoods in 14th century England. And at the time I was finding hundreds of hoods with these little dots around the face. And I thought, oh, those are embroidered. And then I read this piece about the Greenland finds and realized those dots were not embroidery. Those dots were the backside of the finishing stitches that was going on, that were going on on the underside. So in the lower right here on the screen, you can see I've tried to reproduce what I'm seeing in the medieval illuminations. So from all these samples, we can see that the stitches used in period are the backstitch, buttonhole stitch, Bayou tapestry stitch, chain stitch, couch work, counted thread work, gold work, laid work, loop stitch, plate, running, satin, seed, sumac, split stem, and underside couching. If you search how to do backstitch or how to do seed stitch on YouTube, you'll find lots and lots of how-to videos. And some of them are quite good. One of the stitches I wanted to do for my own sanity and to show you is that loop stitch that finished off the edge of the cuff we saw earlier. The diagrams are blown up to show how the stitches work, but when they're executed, they would have been done very, very tightly. You can see on the left, those stitches are pretty large. So if you're gonna do these yourself, make them much smaller. When it's done to scale, it looks like a woven trim. And as you can see, there's a twist inherent in this type of stitch. I didn't add that twist in, that's just how the stitch comes out when you're doing it. So we have our last slide, tips, tricks, and advice. First, don't ever believe the claims that embroidery wool is non-shrink. That's a lie. Uh, a friend of mine did these beautiful wool embroidery sleeves and then she washed her garment and it shrunk. So don't take the chance. A good way to back your fabric to give it some stability while you're tracing your pattern on is to iron on freezer paper on the back of your fabric before using a light box to trace your designs. Tracing with color pencil may work better for you than a mechanical pencil because it has a wider, softer lead. Beware of using washable ink markers used for quilting. Sometimes the ink doesn't wash out. I'm also a quilter, so I know that's true. Another thing that I learned in this process, preparing for this class, is please embroider your sleeves before you sew them shut. Because once a sleeve is sewn shut, it's nearly impossible to embroider. Further, in late, late, late period embroidery, 1600s or 1500s, they would embroider their sleeves before they even cut them out of the fabric. So there's that option as well. Although I don't know how that would have been done, period. 
And remember also to take your seam allowances into account when laying out your embroidery. So here's my bibliography. Lots of good stuff in here. All those links to Alexandra Macon's videos, uh, Dress in Anglo-Saxon England by Gail Owen Crocker is a must read if you're doing Anglo-Saxon clothing. Uh, the Ashmolean is a fantastic resource for uh, buckles. Um, then you have Cloth and Clothing in Early Anglo-Saxon England. That's also a good book. And there's lots of photos that you can go to. Uh, the Gilling Beck Sword, uh, Queen Batilde's Shirt, The Langor Textile. Probably the best book to read for embroidery right now is The Lost Art of the Anglo-Saxon World. That's going to give you a lot of stuff. So, because this class is recorded, if you have questions, please feel free to contact me at amysparrowatlantia at gmail.com. Um, if you could, in your emails, put in the title that it's a question about a class, that would be helpful. And if you like classes on historical clothing, check out my YouTube channel, Quilts and Costumes. And thank you for viewing this class, and I hope the rest of your pensic is wonderful. Bye-bye.